This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Very good evening to you all, and um, thank you for coming along. At the very end of term, and it's a time when I know you have a lot of other calls on your time, I'm very pleased to present this evening Rasa Hussein QC, who will be talking about the rights to asylum in EU law. Now, I suspect that Raza's reputation rather precedes him, but that won't stop me from making a few brief words of introduction. Raza was appointed a silk at Matrix Chambers um, only last year, and previously has been awarded the Human Rights and Public Law Junior of the Year by the Chambers Bar Awards, as well as being nominated this year for the Human Rights Silk of the Year. And of course, there are very good reasons for these nominations. And the list of cases in which Raza has appeared on refugee and human rights issues over the last few years really reads like a list of the leading refugee and human rights cases of the UK and the European uh, area, both the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union. To mention a couple of the cases in which he's appeared before the Supreme Court, the cases of Lumba and Shepard Kambadzi were ones dealing with detention issues, where Raza was the representative or the barrister in both of those cases. He's also successfully appeared in the case of FA Iraq, as recently as May of this year, in which the Supreme Court decided to make a reference on the issues involved in that case, on EU principles of equivalence, to the Court of Justice itself. The, the Home Office, on the basis of that referral, subsequently conceded the case and amended primary legislation. Some of the other notable refugee law cases in which Raza has appeared in recent history include the leading case internationally of H.J. Iran, um, as well as uh, Saidi before the Court of Justice, the European Union, and the party Zimbabwe in the Supreme Court. In the human rights field, many of you will be familiar with the recent decisions before the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Al Skaini and Al Jedi. Those were both cases in which Raza appeared. And I think his biography wouldn't be complete without mention of his um, defining textbook co authored with Nicholas Blake, now Justice Blake on immigration, asylum, and human rights. And I believe that there's a second edition pending for those of you who want to read Raza's arguments in much more detail. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to present our seminar speaker for this evening, and I hand over to Raza. Thank you very much. Can I first of all thank... Can you hear me? Um, can I first of all thank David uh, for his very kind words of introduction and also thank David and Margarita for inviting me to speak uh, to you as part of this um, uh, seminar series. Um, I'm going to speak about the right to asylum in EU law. And you ought to have a short handbook just of materials, uh, a handout of materials, have you forgot that? Um, the first provision I, I want to focus on is Article 18 of the EU Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights. Um, this proclaims the right to asylum. It does so in tremendously interesting terms. Uh, it says this, the right to asylum shall be guaranteed uh, with due respect to the rules of the Geneva Convention and the Protocol and in accordance with the Treaty uh, on the European Union, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, the Charter also uh, contains a provision uh, on non refoulement in 19.2, Article 19.2, which provides, this is the next <coughs> article in, in your handout, this says, no one may be removed, expelled, extradited, etc., uh, to a state where there is a serious risk that he or she will be subject to death penalty, torture, or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And that is simply the case law of the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights, on Article 3, 
uh, reflected in the charter. It's, it's the non-reformal provision. Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of course, proclaimed that everybody had the right to seek and to enjoy asylum in other countries from persecution. The question arises, um, are these articles um, saying the same thing as the UK and Germany have, amongst other states, sought to argue? I would say uh, emphatically no. Article 18 raises a number of very interesting questions. First of all, whose right is it? <coughs> Article 18 lacks an explicit subject. Is it a right of states to grant asylum that is guaranteed? Or is it a right of individuals to receive it? There is no international treaty which explicitly recognises the right of the individual to receive asylum, although some regional treaties do. Moreover, in public international law, asylum has always traditionally been conceived of as a right of states to grant asylum without it being considered a hostile act uh, towards other states. So, for example, Article 1.1 of the UN Declaration on Territorial Asylum says that asylum granted by the state in the exercise of its sovereignty shall be respected by other states. <coughs> However, Dr. Maria, Maria Teresa Gilbarzo has argued compellingly that the right is of the individual to be granted asylum in Article 18. And that is so because, first of all, if you look at the context of the article, the context is the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And the Charter <coughs> recognises rights of individuals rather than those of states. Secondly, an analysis of the drafting history shows that whilst the minority of states, including the UK, uh, were against the idea of enshrining a right of the individual, the majority were in favour of it. And thirdly, if you look at the constitutional traditions of a number of member states, including France, Germany, Italy, uh, Spain, Bulgaria and Hungary, asylum there in those states is conceived of as a right of individuals to be granted asylum. That analysis, um, in a very interesting paper, it's in the Refugee Studies Quarterly, Volume 27.3, and I can give you a reference if, you, if anybody's interested afterwards. That analysis is endorsed um, by uh, one of the most impressive judges on the Court of Justice, the Belgian judge, Judge uh, Kern Lennertz. Um, and he, writing extrajudicially, has said that in particular, Article 18 of the Charter recognises asylum as a right vested in individuals rather than as a prerogative of states. When we move to the relevant secondary legislation, secondary EU legislation, the Qualification Directive, it's even more clear um, that the right is indeed that of the individual uh, to be granted the relevant status, whether refugee status or subsidiary protection status, uh, which includes with it the right of residence, um, rather than the prerogative of the state to grant it. And it is an individual right with the correlative duty on the state. <coughs> You've got uh, on page one of your handout um, the two provisions which make that very clear in the Qualification Directive. Article 13 says member states shall grant refugee status to a third country national stateless person who qualifies. And Article 18 makes similar provision um, for the grant of subsidiary protection status. I would also argue, and this is more controversial, um, that it is, implicit, it is implicit in the Geneva Convention itself, and of course Article 18 refers, Article 18 of the Charter refers to the rules of the Geneva Convention and the Protocol. 
But I would argue that it's implicit in the Geneva Convention um, that there is a contingent duty on the state to determine a claim and to recognise uh, refugee status where the individual meets the refugee definition in Article 1. Articles 1A1, Article 1C4, 1C5, and Article 9 <coughs> all appear to recognise such a contingent duty to determine and grant status. The contingency arises, the duty is contingent, and the contingency arises if otherwise the state will not afford the protections of the Refugee Convention to anybody claiming refugee status. And looking at the duty in that way uh, preserves the vitally important uh, declaratory theory of refugee status, which is set out in um, a lot of literature, most uh, emphatically in the UNHCR's handbook, uh, paragraph 28. And the idea is that you are a refugee when you meet the definition as a matter of fact, and you are presumptively to be treated as a refugee unless and, and until a, state's deter a state determines that you're not. In other words, the act of the state in recognising you is not foundational or constitutive of your refugee status, but simply declaratory of a pre-existing fact. And that is vitally important. That theory is vitally important because otherwise we would have a spectre uh, not only of pushbacks from the seas, which is parenthetically plainly unlawful, contrary to various US Supreme Court and House Laws decisions, and contrary to international human rights law, see the Al-Skane case which David mentioned. But if you didn't have the declaratory theory, not only would you have pushbacks from the high seas, but also from the territory, because the state would say, well, we haven't determined you're a, you're a refugee. It's our determination which constitutes you as a refugee. And because we have determined you as a refugee, refugee, you have no rights, we can simply send you back. So the declaratory theory is very vital to the entire scheme and any argument that there is a duty to determine and grant refugee status must be compatible with that theory. Viewing the duty to recognise and grant status as a contingent duty preserves that theory. And all of this was recognised by the English Court of Appeal about nine years ago in a case called Saab, where it held um, that there was a duty to determine a claim for refugee status even where the individual was not facing a return. The state couldn't finesse, the word it used, it couldn't finesse its obligation to determine status under the Refugee Convention by simply saying, well, we're not going to remove you. Refugee status was the gateway to all those rights uh, which appear in the Refugee Convention between Articles 1 and Article 33, which no one reads. It's the main body of the instrument. Um, it's very clear that it's, a, it's the heart of the instrument, that if you look at the title of the treaty, it says this is a convention relating to the status of refugees. And the beauty of the instrument is that some 60 years ago, it gave a privileged class of aliens um, a set of civil and political rights beyond the right not to be returned. So for all those reasons, I think it is quite apart from the position as a matter of EU law, it is strongly arguable, though controversial, that there is an implicit contingent duty in the Refugee Convention itself to determine a claim. And for all of these reasons, I don't think that in the, as, a, as a matter of EU law or as a matter of modern law, it can be said, as Professor Harvey said some time ago, that the focus remains on the right to seek asylum 
without a strong corresponding duty on the state to grant it. And in this regard, it's notable that recently, in June of this year, the International Criminal Court, in the case of Prosecutor in Tanga, um, uh, held that three witnesses from the DRC who had been brought to the Hague to testify for the defendant um, enjoyed the right to seek asylum based on the UDHR and the Refugee Convention, uh, the right of asylum based on the Charter, uh, the right not to be returned to torture, and the right to an effective remedy without drawing a distinction between those legal norms. That's by way of parenthesis. There's not that much analysis of the differences between those rights uh, in, in, in the decision, and, and that has to be used. So that's the first question, whose right is it? Very clear that it's the right of individuals rather than the prerogative of states. Secondly, um, what does it mean? And um, what is its content? <coughs> now, the preamble confirms that the Charter simply reaffirms existing rights rather than creating new ones. So you've got to look at the existing law, it would appear. And indeed, that's confirmed by the explanations <coughs> drafted by the Presidium which accompany the Charter, and which are there for the purpose of clarifying its provisions, Article 6.1 of the TEU um, states that the rights, etc., in the Charter uh, shall be interpreted with due regard to the explanations. Regarding Article 18, the explanations provide um, that the text of the article has been based on Article 63, of the EC Treaty as amended by Amsterdam, now Article 78, post Lisbon, and that this article is, is in line with the Protocol on Asylum. I'll come back to the Protocol in due course when we look at the personal scope of the Qualification Directive. But leaving that aside, <coughs> we see that the explanations say that this tremendously important right right to asylum is based on previous treaty provisions. That then raises the question, um, is the right to asylum simply coterminous with the directives, etc., regulations that were adopted under those treaty provisions? Or does the right have an independent life beyond those? Um, items of secondary EU legislation. I think it's very strongly arguable that the um, correct answer is the latter answer, that, that the right has an independent line. <coughs> and an analogy can be drawn um, with the jurisprudence um, of the Court of Justice on Equal Pay. In the very famous case of Dufresne and Sadana, the Court of Justice uh, rejected an attempt by the Belgian government to restrict the temporal scope of the principle of equal pay enshrined in Article 119 of the treaty by reference to a directive which had been adopted to give that article effect. The right to have an independent right. Now, so in terms of what the article means, we can repeat a negative claim I made some time ago. What it doesn't mean is what is set out in Article 19.2. It's not restricted to non reformal contrary to the arguments of various states. Article 18 can't be collapsed into Article 19.2, just as rights flowing from refugee status under the Geneva Convention can't be collapsed to Article 33, the prohibition on the full model. What about the positive claim as to the meaning of the right? Um, I think we can say that the right to asylum extends to a right to fair procedures, to decent reception conditions which secure dignity, itself the subject of the opening article in the Charter, and to an effective remedy 
in the face of manifest determination, also the subject of Article, um, article in the Charter, Article 47, and a right to be granted asylum if you meet eligibility criteria. <coughs> now, the third question which arises is, is any of this important as a matter of practice? And I would say it is very important for three reasons. Firstly, it's important in the context of the Dublin Regulation and on the question of the circumstances in which a host state will be precluded from sending an asylum seeker back to the state that is primarily responsible for his or her claim under that regulation. In the case of NS, which concerned a reference from the English Court of Appeal in the context of a return by the UK to Greece of an Afghan asylum seeker, the Advocate General uh, gave her opinion uh, in September of this year. The opinion is disappointing in its analysis of the right to asylum. That receives barely any attention, though it's in its conclusions um, it is broadly um, satisfactory, in my view. Now, her conclusions are set out at page two of your handout, and you'll see why a focus on fundamental rights, including the right to asylum, is so important. <coughs> and you see it's important by looking at paragraphs two and three of her conclusions. Paragraph two, she says, um, that a member state in which an asylum, seek has been, asylum application has been lodged is obliged to exercise its right to examine that application under Article 32. That's the so called sovereignty clause. Um, where, uh, in circumstances where um, sending the individual to the state primarily responsible, transfer to the member state primarily responsible would expose the asylum seeker to a serious risk of violation of his fundamental rights as enshrined in the Charter. Very clear the focus there is on a serious risk of violation of fundamental rights. And that's not a risk of a serious violation, but a real risk, a more than de minimis risk of any violation of fundamental rights. But the inquiry is as to fundamental rights, as one would expect. And that falls to be contrasted with mere breaches of secondary EU asylum legislation, which would not preclude transfer. And you get that from um, paragraph three. Um, serious risks of infringements of individual provisions of other EU law provisions relevant, um, which do not or also constitute a violation of fundamental rights are not sufficient. So the focus is very clearly on fundamental rights. <coughs> the judge rapporteur in this case is Judge Alan Rosas, so we may have a rare case where the court's judgment that may be more enlightening than the Advocate General's opinion, and that would be a first given the constraints of unanimity under which the Court of Justice labours uh, when it gives its judgments. The judgment is due in two weeks on the 21st of December, so watch this space. Now, the UNHCR, in its submission, in this case, suggested various breaches um, of secondary legislation which might amount to uh, breaches of fundamental rights, including the right to asylum. We can pick up on some of those um, after um, the talk if, if, if you want. But for example, um, non-suspensive procedures uh, or, or remedies or lack of free legal assistance, um, uh, contrary to the Procedures Directive, Article 7, Article uh, 15, um, could amount to a breach of the right to asylum and a breach of the right to judicial protection. Effective remedies, see Article 47 of the Charter. Excessively short time frames, precluding 
the possibility which proper scrutiny might amount to the breach uh, of the fundamental right. I would say they, would, they, they, they do so. Mandatory detention programs, other than for very limited periods of time. Um, material reception conditions that don't secure the protection of health and subsistence and so forth. But there are a range of um, matters where the breach is sufficiently serious. And it's not simply a mere breach of secondary legislation, where I think it's very strongly arguable that you would have a breach, a breach of fundamental right. <coughs> the um, second reason I want to move on to as to why a focus on fundamental rights, including the right to asylum, is important in practice, is in the present controversial context of the UK's decision to refuse to opt into the recast qualification reception and procedures directives. Um, the consequence would appear to be a two-tier EU asylum system contrary to the objective of a common policy and harmonisation. But there would be no escaping from fundamental rights as set out in the Charter. So for example, the new the recast reception directive there is a six-month limit on detention in the context of examination. That combined with the returns directive, where there are similar limits, six months, generally 18 months in exceptional situations, um, I think very, it's very strongly argued would have consequences for the UK, even though the UK has opted out, or refused to opt in rather, to those instruments, and will have consequences for the UK through the prism of fundamental rights analysis in the Charter either breach of right to asylum or breach of right to liberty is a fundamental right, Article 6 of the Charter. And the third practical reason why it's important to focus on the right to asylum as a matter of, of Charter law is that the qualification directive is seriously deficient. And I could just give two clear examples. You've got the relevant provision set out at page three of your handout. It's firstly deficient in its personal scope. Article 2C defines refugee status in the manner set out in your handout, and you might think there's nothing wrong with that. It seems to be very closely modelled on the Geneva Convention, and of course it is. But if you look at the fourth, fifth, and sixth words, third country national. Now, that is a limitation which doesn't appear in Article 1 of the Refugee Convention. Under the Geneva Convention, any person is a refugee who fulfills um, the eligibility criteria. Moreover, the refugee definition in Article 1 um, is non reservable See Article 42 of the Geneva Convention. Um, as a matter of EU law, the right to assign for member state nationals is clearly recognised, albeit exceptionally. And we see that from the protocol, Protocol 24 on asylum for nationals of member states, and that's annexed to the treaties. And that's the next <coughs> extract that you've got um, in the handout. And this uh, provides that whilst member states of the EU shall be regarded as constituting safe countries of origin, member states do have the discretion to determine a claim for refugee status from another national of a member state and to grant status, um, albeit they've got to inform the council and they've got to start with a presumption that the claim is manifestly unfounded, but clearly the protocol recognises the right to asylum that is not limited to third country nationals. The protocol is itself very controversial, it's arguably contrary, and if it is contrary, to Article 3 of the Geneva Convention, which prohibits discrimination based on nationality. But the right, as I've said, is recognised. It arose the protocol arose out of a spat between uh, Belgium and Spain over a Belgian refusal to extradite members of ETA. 
a, a further deficiency in the qualification directive concerns exclusion from status. And you've got the relevant provision set out at the top of page 4 of your handout, it's article 14. <coughs> what article 14, five, uh, 4 and 5 do is to graft onto an exclusion clause excluding people from refugee status, that which in the Geneva Convention is simply a limitation on the right not to be refooled in Article 33. But what's set out in 14.4 is contained not in Article 1F of the Refugee Convention, which, which is the analog of Article 14, and excludes people from refugee status altogether, it excludes them from all of the benefits of the Convention. It's not in there. What, where you find the analog of Article 14.4 is in Article 33.2 of the Refugee Convention, which simply takes away the right not to be refooled, but there are many other rights in the Refugee Convention, as I've already said. And it's, moreover, the grant of, it, of refugee status has an international character. You could have an individual who could find somewhere else to go with his refugee status grant, not under the EU qualification directive. And it's very clear that there's something wrong with this, because if you look at Article 21 in the qualification directive, that just simply repeats that, Article 21 is the other of Article 33. It's, it's the saving on the right not to be reformed. So Article uh, 14, uh, 4 and 5 <coughs> are clearly ultra vires, the community's competence to legislate in asylum matters. They're ultra vires, um, Article 63 of EC Treaty as amended by Amsterdam, and ultra vires, Article 78. Uh, of the uh, TFEU, EU, EU competence to legislate is conditional on compatibility with Geneva. The Geneva Convention is the cornerstone and remains the cornerstone of international human rights law. There's another question about whether or not it should be, why, whether or not subsidiary protection or other forms of protection should be a second tier form of protection. But as a matter of um, description, it's very clear that the Geneva Convention is the cornerstone of international human rights law. So those are three reasons why it's very important to focus on the Charter right to asylum. Um, I want to say uh, one more thing about the Qualification Directive before we move off it. Um, a key innovation of the Directive it is that it is the first time that any international instrument has uh, granted a form of status for some refugee harm. It's the first reason why it's very important and innovative. Um, the second key innovation of the directive, the qualification directive, is the elevation of what was ad hoc state practice on granting protection to victims of civil war or indiscriminate violence elevating that to a legal norm. And we see that in Article 15C of the Qualification Directive, and you have that set out at again, page 4 of your handout. And this raises very interesting uh, questions on the relationship between um, that provision and Article 3 of the ECHR, which is reflected imperfectly in 15B. So Article 15, of the Qualification Directive defines serious harm as uh, death penalty execution, interestingly not unlawful killing, we, we have added that in our immigration rules in the UK. But then B, 15B, torture, human degrading treatment punishment in the country of origin, that, that is intended to exclude um, D or N type cases, so cases which um, concern uh, health and exposure to um, ill treatment arising from lack of health, 
facilities in the country of origin because there the ECHR has said the violation occurs also in the sending state. That's the intention of the words in the country of origin in 15b. But 15c is what I want to focus on for the present. That is serious and individual threat to a civilian's life or person by reason of indiscriminate violence in situations of international or internal armed conflict. Now, the reason that was initially um, included uh, by the Commission in a very liberal proposal was that it was erroneously thought that this was not covered by Article 3. The provision um, got very seriously uh, kiboshed during the Danish presidency, in particular by the French, but the Court of Justice appears to have rescued it to some extent by uh, reading out the words individual to all intents, intents and purposes, out of 15c. But the relationship between 15c and Article 3 uh, is, as I've said, very interesting. The Article 3 case law on harm arising in a class context um, has developed. And the key cases uh, begin with the case of Vilvaraja, where it appeared to be an open question as to whether or not a person had to show that they were worse off than everybody else in their class. So did they have to show that the, they were worse off than others as a matter of evidence, or was that a legal requirement? In other words, regardless of how bad the situation was in the country of origin, did you have to show that you were facing a predicament that was worse? Um, rather like the appalling analysis in the UK House of Lords case of Adam on the Refugee Convention. This meant if, that's, if that was right, if it was a legal requirement that you have to show you were worse off for the purposes of Article 3, that would have the very unattractive consequence. The worse the general position in the country, the less likely that Article 3 would give protection. And unsurprisingly, that view shared by many people, including, for example, Dr. Story, uh, an upper tribunal judge here, uh, was rejected in the later jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court. It was rejected in some shape in a case called NA uh, v Sri Lanka, in the UK concerning Sri Lanka. And it was then that the Luxembourg court in a case called El Ghaffaji uh, looked at uh, the Article 15C, uh, the meaning of Article 15C, uh, and said um, that where the situation was sufficiently bad um, in the country of origin, such that an individual simply by being there would face a sufficiently dark predicament, 15C kicked in. <coughs> the Strasbourg Court, though, came back in a very important case called Sufi and Elming. You've got the extract from that decision there at page 4, decided in June this year. And this basically said, look, forget about what the Court of Justice said in the Al-Gafaji. We can give the same protection. And that raises a very interesting question as to what now 15C can be said to add to Article 3. Article 3, as I've already shown you, is basically covered by Article 15B of the directive. And I think that the, it is very unexplored territory, but the better view is a view that has been rejected by the leading domestic case on this provision, a case called QD Iraq. And that, and the idea is that what 15C adds is giving protection in the context of widespread conflict to a real risk of a threat, even if that won't materialise because that is recognised as relevant harm in international humanitarian law. And it is arguable that IHL norms, while they don't control the meaning of this term, can help to inform it. So a real risk of a threat, a threat that wells will be contaminated. 
and you, do, you wouldn't need to show that that threat would eventually, eventually even to a real risk standard in order to get home. Otherwise, it appears very much that 15C is simply replicating 15B, given the recent jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court on Article 3 and the Court of Justice in Al Qaeda. <coughs> but that's an interesting and difficult question as to what quite what the sphere of application is. Um, it's late and I want to close um, my talk by examining what I think is a very important question, which has received very little analysis thus far, and that is the question of uh, what is happening in law when somebody claims asylum in a member state? What happens when a person claims asylum in the UK? Are they claiming asylum um, under EU law, or are they claiming asylum under the Geneva Convention as domesticated in UK law, or are they doing both things? I think the answer is surely they're doing both things, and that is a very important question, because otherwise what you're going to have is the Court of Justice binding all uh, member states' domestic courts on the application of the relevant refugee provision. And you can test it this way. Imagine if, um, on the question of non-state agents of persecution, France and Germany had won out in the directive. So imagine the qualification directive said that if you're facing uh, persecution from a non-state actor, you're, out, you're outside the convention, you can't get refugee status. Imagine if that was a position under the qualification directive, and it could have been. What would happen here if somebody claimed refugee status from a non-state actor? Would the courts say that the individual was barred from refugee status? Or would they say, well, we're going to follow the meaning of the Refugee Convention as declared by our House of Lords to be the true meaning, which encompasses um, non-state uh, actors of persecution. We subscribe to the protection theory rather than the accountability theory, as it's sometimes called. And therefore, the individual is within the contemplation of Refugee Defense Convention, surely the courts would follow the House of Lords on the Refugee Convention, rather than saying, oh well, EU law has totally occupied the arena to the exclusion of the Refugee Convention. Now, as it happens, France and Germany didn't win out. The Qualification Directive contemplates um, granting refugee status to non-state actors, of course it does. But the theoretical question, which has massively important practical consequences in terms of the binding nature of the Court of Justice's views, that question can't turn on what the qualification directive happens to include. Again, this is an area where you need to watch this space. It was a, a question which was raised in a reference by the Supreme Court in a case called F.A. Iraq. That reference was then conceded by the government which amended relevant domestic legislation. So we're not going to have an answer for that in the near future. And that's all I want to say for the moment. If there are any questions, um, maybe you can put them. Thank you very much. Before I bring to the floor, there are really a couple of questions and one comment that I'd like to make. On the last question that you raised about would the courts follow the European position, the European Union position, or would they follow the Anne House of Lords' true interpretation? 
My recollection, although it's slightly hazy, is that that question has been canvassed, at least obliquely, in some of the cases that were before the House of Lords on particular social groups, where it was felt that the European legislation on that point was simply not correct, and that the true meaning was that of the Refugee Convention. So perhaps that's an indication of, of some answer to that question, even if it doesn't properly resolve it on the theoretical level. Um, and I suppose the wider question that I just wanted to pose, and this may be something you want to come back to later, is to say we've looked quite a lot in, in past seminars at the idea that refugee laws become increasingly regionalised. And I think that your question in part speaks to that, whether there is a true meaning of a refugee convention that is an international meaning, or whether we see different regions of the world taking increasingly diverse views of not only what a refugee is, but accordingly what asylum itself would mean. To give you but one example, the kinds of jurisprudence that have been generated recently on, for example, women as a particular social group, I can think of numerous states um, in the Asian subcontinent which would not subscribe to that as being the correct interpretation, even if those things do have a currency in the European context. Uh, and the very last question really is, we've heard quite a lot in recent weeks and months about the problems that the EU is going through. Do you think any of the political developments in the next five years might have an impact on the legal framework that we're talking about here in the longer term? I suppose those are things that perhaps you need to take a few minutes to think about. Are there any other questions which people would like to raise in the meantime? Yes. Um, there's more of a, a practical um, question about whether there have been cases in the UK of EA nationals claiming asylum and whether the, the UK opting out of the directive will have any, um, any impact on how those are dealt with. Um, just to answer that question first, I, I'm not aware of um, cases where yeah, yeah, nationals have played asylum in the UK. Then I'm sure there are cases which would raise Protocol 24 and ought to raise its compatibility with Article 3. The problem is in, in our dual system, Article 3. I'm not clear whether that's patriated. Well, I think it's very strongly arguable that it, it is. Um, because it's very strongly arguable that all the immigration relevant articles of the um, convention are patriated. What I mean by the immigration relevant articles, I mean articles 132 and 43 are patriated. So I think you could argue that any restriction on one um, had to be looked at compatibly with the non discrimination provision in Geneva. But I mean, it, it, that's the, the opting up. Issue. The, the, the UK is opting out of the recast directive. Um, and I don't think that it, that would have a, a, any repercussions or consequences for um, such a claim. I don't know if that answers your question, probably not. Um, in answer to David's observations and questions, I mean, first of all, I'd say that he's absolutely right in the issue of the um, correctness of Article 10 of the Qualification Directive, which defines a particular social group, did arise in a case called Fauna, came in Fauna, and then the House of Lords had no difficulty at all in preferring UNHCR's view and, and the applicant's view on the correct meaning of um, the correct approach of a particular social group. And they read, art, and they read a, what Article 10 regards as a conjunctive condition, as a disjunctive they read and for all. But what isn't clear at all in the House of Lords decision is whether or not they were purposely construing the directive or recognising that we could just completely forget about the directive and we're really dealing with the Refugee Convention. But this is an area where, as a matter of union law, there is shared competence between the EU and member states. It's also very interesting that all the transposing provisions, every single one of them, um, refers to the Geneva Convention. Um, on David's second um, observation, 
in terms of the increase, increasing regionalisation of um, the approach to refugee status and the institution of asylum. I suppose the problem is the lack of a supranational court. Um, states um, can refer matters to the ICJ under Article 39. It's never been executed. Article 39, Article 40, I forget which, Article 39. Um, and in the absence of a supranational court, the, the fiction is that each state is divine on the true meaning. And that, that is the governing meaning for wherever you find yourself. So I suppose, yes, there is an uh, irresistible impetus towards regionalization. Uh, in terms of your third observation, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a politician. Okay, I'll open the floor for more comments. Yes, Parish. Thank you for your talk. Um, essentially, I want to return back to this point that you made about the right to asylum being an individual right as opposed to the right of the state to grant asylum. But if you look at the drafting history of the Refugee Convention, then for example, at the at the uh, conference of plenipotentiaries and the uh, trial, trial, trial where they talk, the states were very much talking about the need to protect state interests. That's one of the reasons why the exclusion clauses were drafted. If you look at the final act of the conference, which talked very aspirationally about how it was hoped that the states would act with a certain spirit. The trial of prior trial appears to suggest that states are very much inclined to protect their own interests rather than necessarily enforcing the rights of refugees. So there's, there's this balance struck between state rights and individual rights. And I want to ask why you think it's, it, it, it pans up more in favour of individual rights rather than state rights? Bearing in mind what was discussed during the conference. Well, I mean, you were talking about an area where the state was a subject of international law rather than the individual, and it's, that's changed. Um, in the, that's been the biggest change in public international law, it's where you've got human rights instruments, it's, it's the individual that's the subject of international law. Um, I, I think that on a contemporary construction of the Refugee Convention, it's a very, it's very strongly argued. Um, that there is a right in the individual to um, have his or her claim determined in the way I set out a contingent duty on the state to determine the claim. Um, but of course you're right, I mean, states are very, very wary of any incursion into their sovereign right to control their borders, which arose um, when I think there was a lot of Chinese immigration to the West in the late um, 19th century. It's massively open to debate as to whether or not um, what is now regarded as uh, sort of black letter, uh, non-controversial law, that states can do whatever the hell they want with aliens, um, was ever in fact true. There's an article by I think Vicenzi, um, Christopher Vicenzi, which takes that to task. But of course you're right um, that traditionally the right to asylum was always seen as a right of the state to grant it without upsetting the home state. Sorry, the home state. Good. Any further questions or comments? Yes, that's on. Well, I'm just running through your arguments again about why the charter is important. And one of them is because the QTS, the qualification directive, is deficient, and you cited Article 14.4. I'm trying to think of ways in which, I mean, we agree with you. Um, it's terrible that two Article 33 is conflated with this, but how, how would we use the charter to challenge that? Well, you, it, it's another means. Well, it. it the, the reason I cited that was to say that you, what you certainly can't do is um, collapse the right to the secondary legislation because you might get some complete nonsense in the secondary legislation. You've got lots of nonsense in, in all the secondary legislation, not just the qualification directive, but the procedures directive, which doesn't give suspensive remedies, for example, is completely ridiculous. It's incompatible with um, decades of 
community work. Quite often, the answer. So, I suppose, it's not, you, and in a sense, you didn't need, you wouldn't need our great team to, um, uh, have that provision struck out as being outside the virus of the community to, the union to adopt it, because you've got that in the enabling legislation already, you've got, uh, EU competence to legislate being conditional on compliance with Geneva anyway, and the Court of Justice has said it. I suppose Article 18 gives you more, um, you know, a further reason in support of that argument. But I, mean, I can illustrate the point in another way. I mean, the, the qualification directive is not only deficient in its personal scope. But it's also territorially limited. You've got to be on the state's territory. Now, that is compatible with the view of the Supreme Court in the sale case that when you stop a boatload of Haitian refugees and just chuck them back to the sharks in the uh, Atlantic Ocean, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's amazingly that case was approved by Lord Hope in, in Horvath, not a ridiculous decision of our House of Lords. But it's not compatible with any um, decent or tenable view of jurisdiction. And so I think you know, Italian practice isn't simply contrary to um, Article 3 in terms of the you know, living refugees and coming across the Mediterranean. That's not simply compatible with Article 3, but I think it's incompatible with Article 18 and the right to asylum uh, guaranteed that, although it wouldn't be compatible with the qualification directive because you'd have to be on the territory. Um, so, so my example of Article 14 is simply an example of how it's dangerous to focus simply on the secondary legislation and say, well, um, because of the explanations to the Charter, the content of the Article 18 right is simply given by um, secondary legislation and is a readable. Good. Yeah. I'm new to this, so please forgive me if I am. Um, on the section that we were talking about, the comparative theory, um, so does that mean that we're approaching the science the, the wrong way around? In the sense that they're already in science, but they have to be proven not to. Is that the wrong around the approach of wrong? Um, what do you say, we? Do you mean, who do you mean? I mean the British government. Have they approached, have they, they called somebody, um, they're not an asylum seeker, they have been proven to be an asylum seeker first. Is that the wrong way around? Should they be proven, be proven not to be an asylum seeker? No. Um, Despite the rhetoric, the UK government, generally speaking, the Chilean Alexander, correct if I'm wrong, David, correct if I'm wrong, generally speaking, observes its convention obligations despite the rhetoric. It's a matter of law. It's, it's broadly pretty good about that, I think. There are some nasty provisions which hopefully will get dealt with in due course. But, um, no, what, I was, what the UK does is it says, look, you come here, you make a claim, um, you have to prove your claim, essentially, although the burden of proving it is shared. Okay? We may have material um, that's relevant to your claim, and broadly speaking, we'll disclose that, although there's a terrible case which says they don't have to, but that's been ignored, basically, over the last 10 years or so. Um, so the individual's got to prove their case, but whilst they're proving their case, and this is the key point, they, they're not chucked back, which a purely constitutive theory would allow you to do. That's the madness and the absurdity and the illogicality of the purely constitutive theory, the theory that you're not a refugee unless and until the state creates you as one, would allow an individual to be simply sent back. It's completely mad. And what the UK does is that whilst the claim is under consideration, it does <coughs> give the individual those rights in the convention 
which attach to refugees by reason of their presence. So, for example, um, immunity from criminal prosecution for unlawful entry under Article 31 of the Refugee Convention. That has been held to apply um, not simply to uh, refugees recognised as such, but people whose claims were being determined. Okay, are there any final comments or questions that people would like to make? This is your last chance. Yes. Talking about the right to asylum in the European Union context, I think the matter of cooperation <coughs> among member states is worthy of question this evening. How was the term cooperation under Article 4.1 of the Qualification Directive, if I am correct, has been interpreted in national legislation and jurisprudence in the UK? Article 4.1. Am I right? In essence, that's a duty of cooperation. Duty of cooperation. So, in, in the assessment of the facts and circumstances. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, it touches on something I just said a moment ago. It's a very interesting question. Um, there's an appalling House Lords case, there are many appalling House Lords cases in this area, but another one is called Abdeen Garway where in the context of the third country return, the House Lords held by a majority that a state that the UK did not have to produce evidence um, that harmed its case and assisted that of the individual. It was left to the individual to um, marshal his or her evidence. It's an absolutely mad decision and it's been ignored because you can read it very narrowly as turning on the relevant secondary domestic legislation, right, which exempted the Home Office from producing something called an explanatory statement, which they had to do in other, other cases, um, other cases of substantive refugee law claims. This was a third country case, the Abdeen Galway case. So I think that the duty of cooperation, which you also find in um, the UN handbook, the UNHCR's handbook, um, generally speaking, what happens is the individual gives their personal account and the, um, the state is supposed to, and the UK generally does, apply that account to its understanding of the general situation. And in that sense, the individual isn't left to uh, produce all the evidence. Obviously, if the individuals agree, when he or she loses his claim, then they've got to do that. But no, there is, there is a, the, the duty of cooperation, in my experience, has always been observed, observed despite this aberration in the context of third country um, cases created by Abu and I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yes, okay. What is this terrible proof that you described to this asylum claim? That's question one. The second is... I didn't hear that. Sorry, could you just repeat that? Sorry. What is the standard of proof required in this claim when you establish your yeah. And does it vary from the, yeah, at different stages? What it is the first initial stage of screen war and yeah. the other? Um, that's a very interesting question. The, the, the second part of the question, the answer is simple. No, it doesn't. It's, it's the same test. But what is the test? Well, um, I think it's pretty clear that in our law, it's the same test under the Refugee Convention as it is under Article, uh, up, uh, under the ECHR, Article 3 in particular, as it is <coughs> under the Qualification Directive. And that is to say that the test is um, whether or not um, there are serious reasons for believing there to be a real risk of exposure to the prohibited arm. And that is the same thing as a real risk. It's the same thing as a serious possibility. And there are, the leading case domestically in the context of the Refugee Convention is a case called Siva Kamara, um, where the House Lords uh, appeared to endorse a decision of um, the US Supreme Court in a case called INS and Cardozo Fonseca, where um, uh, Justice Stevens had said that a one in 10 chance 
would suffice. And you can think of it this way. Look at the, the gravity of the harm that the individual is facing. Um, if there was a 1 in 10 chance of um, tomorrow morning you opening your car door and having a bomb in it, would you say that was a serious risk? Obviously it is. Um, the, the domestic case law, after a few wrinkles along the way, has settled um, to the effect that that's essentially a real risk standard, um, whether you're talking under the Refugee Convention or on BCHR. And by real risk, what is meant is any risk that isn't fanciful, it's not balanced of probabilities. Well, so if I can just tackle you with one last question. This is really how exclusion fits into the idea of a right to asylum. At what point does exclusion kick in? Does it mean that you don't have a right to asylum, or that you have your that your right to asylum is at some later point qualified or reduced? And I think of this specifically because, as you mentioned, it is one of those areas where regional organisations tend to add in things. I think particularly of the OAU Refugee Convention, where they have an additional ground for exclusion, which isn't included in the Geneva Refugee Convention. And it sounds rather like the Qualification Directive incorporates Article 32 almost as a ground for exclusion. Does that mean that one does not have a right to assign, or that there is a right to assign, but in some way that, that is later during the determination process um, seem to end? What would be your views on that? Um, again, that's a very interesting question. I think what it exposes is the difference between the institution of asylum, or the concept of asylum, which, which means protection, essentially. The difference between that and the concept of refugee status. Because whilst you can be excluded from refugee status, <coughs> I think the, it's very clear that in modern international law, if you're facing certain kinds of harm, you can't be excluded from um, uh, protection against that harm, no matter what you've done. You, know, you may not get the, the other rights that the, the, the refugee would get or, or the person eligible to a particular status would get, but what you can't be is removed. So, for example, if you're facing torture, you can't be removed from Article 3 of CAP. It's an international standard. Similarly, the ICCPR Article 7, which is the analog of Article 3 of the ECHR, that's been interpreted by the Human Rights Committee in General Comment 15 to have a non formal extraterritorial component, which is non durable And in courts which have suggested that the institution of asylum um, is derogable, or individuals can be excluded from it, have been very badly chastised and they're aberrant decision I'm thinking in particular of the Suresh case, Canadian Supreme Court criticised, repeatedly criticised by the Committee Against Torture, set up under um, CAT. So whilst there may be regional dif differences in terms of exclusion from status that are understandable, I think that they can't be important to be um, ex regional differences from excluding people from asylum. Okay, and that would imply in that case that the <coughs> fundamental characteristic of asylum is non reformal as opposed to the rights between Articles 2 and 33, and that those are really an add on for those who happen to be refugees and, make, and meet that definition. I guess that would be the next point in mind. Yeah, that's the CIL norm, the Cosmic National Norm, mm -hmm. and in some sense, in, in, in some circumstances, depending upon how bad the treatment is, the use cogent norm. That's, that's the point. Okay. So in that case, asylum really is very little different from a principle of non-reform. If we get to that point, <coughs> um, it, it, no, I can I can see the force of that argument, but internationally, I would say that that that, that, that is our force. Regionally, no. Okay. Fine. Any final questions? I know that we've had a good number of questions and some very taxing ones, and some ones which have allowed um, a degree of engagement with the system in the UK. Any final words? No. Well, in that case, I'd just like to thank Raza again very much for what was a tour de force of a very difficult concept. To sign on, we talk about a lot, but what a sign actually means is often much less evident, and especially when you get into the technicalities of EU law, which I don't purport to be an expert on whatsoever. Yes, I've certainly learned a great deal from this evening, so thank you very, very much for us.